All right, welcome to Black Swan Revelations. My name is Shane, and in today's video, I'm going to do a little snapshot of the book of Hebrews. Now, I'm not going to read every single verse. I'm not going to read every chapter. I'm just going to highlight a few things, something for you to think about, for you to meditate on, to chew on, and hopefully when you leave from watching this video that you'll uh, want to read the book of Hebrews even more. I can't tell you how many times I've read the book of Hebrews in the last year. It's for sure over a dozen times. Don't know how many. I love this book. There are several debates going on as to who the authorship is, and I'm going to share that. But before I dive into the meat and potatoes of this book, I want you to do me a favor, and that is subscribe to this channel right now because it helps me build this channel and get these videos out to people so that they can watch it. Maybe they're new Christians. Maybe they've never read the Bible. Maybe they've never read the book of Hebrews. And my goal is to share with as many people as humanly possible on this platform. So if you did that, I would greatly appreciate it. And secondly, if you could let me know where you're watching these videos from, I would appreciate that as well. And feel free to leave a comment, especially if you got something out of this. Again, I would appreciate it. So Hebrews chapter 1, God who had sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken <clears throat> unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So right out of the gate, we get Jesus Christ as the creator of all the worlds. That is pretty amazing. And he is also heir of all things. All things belong to Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto the which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son? Nowhere. He's never referred to angels as his children, as his son, anything like that. Especially as his only begotten son. Which is cool. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, and of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. This is the first glimpse of Jesus Christ's deity, if you will, in the book of Hebrews that he is equal to God himself. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Three distinct personalities, if you will, but one God. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. He is eternal, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Jesus Christ is alive today, and he lives forever, for all eternity. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and shall be changed but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? 
there's a lot in chapter one that goes pretty deep, but basically we're getting a picture that Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of the worlds. And he has the highest name in the whole universe. The best name, if you will. No one else gets this name. No one else. No one else has a more excellent name than Jesus Christ. So the author here is clearly making a distinction between angels and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is more powerful than any of the angels, including the devil. Sometimes we give the devil too much power. We're, we're so afraid of the devil and all this kind of stuff. But really... At the end of the day, Jesus Christ, if he were to draw his breath from the earth, there'd be nobody left. Nothing. Just nothing. We'd all be done. So he is the most powerful person on the universe. This is what chapter one is all about. Setting the stage. Therefore, chapter two, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him? So this author knows the disciples. Because again, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord? So Jesus Christ was talking to these people here and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Which is very interesting. So it was confirmed. And Paul probably had several conversations, not only with Paul, but probably Jesus' brothers as well about everything that Jesus said. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, wherefore we speak, but in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So this is just another way of saying that everything has been put under the feet of Jesus Christ. Everything. Right now, presently, we don't see everything put under him. Just yet. Why? There's still there's still a couple of things to do. There's still, you have to restore all of heaven. You have to restore earth. And you have to get rid of death. Death and hell. That hasn't happened yet. One day, death and hell is going to be tossed into the lake of fire. That is known as the second death. That hasn't happened yet. People die still today. All right. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. This is the whole reason why Jesus became a human being, was to die for us. So this is what it means when Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, meaning he could be killed. Angels live forever. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he may, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Jesus tasted death for us. We don't have to taste death. That's done. Jesus said to Martha, whoever believes in me will not perish, but will live forever. Excuse me, and he asked, do you believe this? She's like, yes. 
for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying i will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will i sing praise unto thee and again i will put my trust in him and again behold i and the children which god hath given me last part for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So this is one of the reasons why Jesus came as a human being, so that through death he could destroy the power of death. The power of death is keeping people in the grave. That is, the devil. The devil had power over people before Jesus Christ came to earth. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So this is one of the things is people were afraid that when they die, that's it. Done. Done deal. And that was fear. So they couldn't step out. They were always worried about it. They're always fearful. And the devil had a grip over people. Until Jesus Christ came. Verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, so he didn't become an angel, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. This is very important later in the book of Hebrews. But for now, we, we have to understand that he didn't show up as an angel. He showed up as a human being from the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, he, it behoved him that he might be like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So this is what I want to talk about for a couple of minutes, and then we'll wrap this up with a nice little bow, and then perhaps I can make another video continuing on. But that word right here, Tempted. Let's talk about that. For in that he himself hath suffered, suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So now there are people that are going to say that when they read this, they're like, okay, Jesus, you know, he understood temptations, you know, like, you know, looking lustfully unto women, pornography, murder, all this kind of stuff. He knew those temptations. So because he's a human being, he understands when we are tempted by this kind of thing. That's what level one people would say. I always tease my sister with this. We we tease each other back and forth when we're talking about the Bible. Like, is this a level one revelation or is this a level 10 revelation? At least to us, between my sister and I. And sometimes we have revelations that are like, oh, this is a level 10. And maybe to someone else, it's like a level four or something, but we just have fun with that. So here, hopefully I can boost you up from level one and go a little bit deeper. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So another way of looking at tempted is when Paul was trying to write all his Pauline epistles, he was being persecuted by the Jews. And not only the Jews, pockets of priests, pockets of Greeks, I should say. And they were trying to kill him. They were trying to not let him reach out to the Gentiles. And they were trying to kill him, assassinate him, all this kind of stuff. So every assassination attempt was a temptation for Paul. That's another way of saying he was he was being attacked. So whenever he talked about 
you know my temptations. He's talking about people that were trying to kill him. He's not talking about, you know, I was succumbing to lust. You know my temptation for lust. That's not what he was talking about. This is what grade one people think. Whenever they see temptation, they're like, oh, that's what that means. Here's another way to look at temptation. Temptation means being stretched. You're being stretched. Jesus knew what it was like to be stretched to the max. He was nailed to a cross. His feet were nailed to a cross. His hands were nailed to a cross. And he got speared by one of the soldiers. Probably right under the fifth rib. And blood and water came out. Some people say that this could have been um, because he had a broken heart. That this is why he died. Heart attack maybe. Who knows? But it's significant that blood and water came out. And he was clearly dead. He clearly died on the cross. But my point is, he was tempted to the max. Tempted to the max. And so if we are being stretched to the max as well, he understands. And don't forget, most likely we've never been to the brink where Jesus was. We've never sweated droplets of blood. Until you've done that, being stressed out that you're going to be killed, uh, you probably won't have a full appreciation of what Jesus did fully. And you, you can't say, oh yeah, I know exactly what Jesus went through. He could say that because he was stretched to the max. And he knew what was coming. He knew he was going to die on the cross. Therefore, droplets of blood started forming on his head and dropping down to the ground. So he was stretched. Another way to look at this is almost like metal, if you will. So when you heat something up with metal, it begins to melt. And there's ways to cool it. But, but sometimes if you cool it off too fast, that metal can become brittle or it could solidify at the wrong time and then you can't mold it or bend it anymore. Maybe this is one of the reasons why Jesus walked on water. He didn't go inside the water. Why? Because he still had to be stretched out onto the cross to be stretched, to be molded for us. Almost like he was like metal, if you will, being formed for all eternity to be a template for us. And his scars are permanent on him, his hands, his feet, his rib. And because of that, because of his being stretched out to the max, and dying on the cross, he could now understand our sufferings, especially we're, when we're in a similar fashion, if we're being persecuted, going through whatever situation that we're in, he understands it 100%. And the reason why I use the term terminology that it's like metal and his body is actually being stretched and being formed is because when, when he died and then rose again, all the disciples saw the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet and the holes in the side. And in fact, he told Thomas and the disciples, stick your hand in here. Stick your hand in my, in my, uh, stick your fingers in my holes and believe. Stop doubting. And the reason why, again, that I use, and another reason why I use the, the metal terminology where Jesus was being stretched, was being formed on the cross as a template, is we see an example here of that process happening. And I'll just, I'll just show you what I mean here. Let's look at this real quick here. 
So this would be, so verse 27, then he saith to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither my hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, yet have believed. So if you go back, if you go back one chapter, we see Jesus being molded on the cross. Where does he say? Uh, right here, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So his body is now formed, stretched to the max. And he died. But then he rose again three days later. And if we go over to verse Verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, because Mary is wondering where he was, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Isn't that interesting? So this kind of falls in line with my thinking where Jesus was being stretched. He was being molded. Again, almost like metal. To the point where Mary could touch him. He said, don't touch me. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still molding, if you will. I know this is just my interpretation, but it kind of fits because now that's his permanent body that he designed himself based on what happened on the cross. That's almost like a, I can see it being a permanent fixture that for all eternity, we see the, the holes we see the holes in his feet, maybe the side as well, in some way. And it's just interesting that Jesus tells her, don't, don't touch me yet, I haven't ascended to the Father. It's almost like, I haven't cooled off yet. <laughs> just kind of cool. It's an interesting thought. But that's it for, for this video. I hope you get something out of this. Um, if you like this kind of thing, uh, my plan is to make another video and continue on and hopefully get through the whole book of Hebrews. And I'm telling you, it gets better and better, especially if you realize the author is the Holy Spirit. So again, hopefully you got something out of this. Feel free to subscribe to this channel. Feel free to share it, talk about it, and then also uh, feel free to leave a comment. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video. Bye for now.